we started this new message series studying the, the entire book of Daniel um, about seven weeks ago. We are officially halfway through. Um, however, I want you to know, as some of you have been saying, how much longer is this? And I'm like, you can flip ahead and you can see there's 12 chapters in the book of Daniel. Um, even though it's taken us uh, quite, um, you know, longer than six weeks to get to where we are today, I will tell you that it won't take an additional six weeks to finish out the book. So uh, we will kind of um, take some of those chapters and combine them in ways that we feel like kind of are appropriate, and we will be able to get through them faster. But we've been learning uh, that the book of Daniel is an interesting book, specific, specifically in how it is written, uh, the first six chapters being kind of this narrative of Daniel's life. It's kind of like a biography of who Daniel is and what he did and what his character was like and all of these really great things that we've been really loving to, to learn uh, about Daniel. And then the last half of the book um, is, is more of a prophetic uh, prophecy part of the book that has a lot of connections in it with Revelation. And we'll be able to hop into that last half in just a few weeks. But next week will be our VBS celebration, and we wanted to remind you that we will not be meeting in here next Sunday. We will be meeting over there. I don't know, where, where are we? Is that Utah? I don't know where that is. A Nevada? I don't know. If you go through those double doors today on your way out, you can get a peek at what Vacation Bible School looks like, and your mind will be blown. It's pretty amazing. Um, once we add the lights and the rest of the stuff, it, it will just be awesome. So next Sunday, we will be in there. And we hope that you will come, invite some friends and neighbors. It's going to be an awesome Sunday as we just celebrate with our kids and with our families all that they learned throughout Vacation Bible School. So that'll be a little bit of a break from Daniel, and we'll be in there next week just reminding you. And so um, there's a total of these 12 chapters. We've been learning about Daniel's life along with learning about his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, we've called our series, we've kind of titled it Resolute, and we've been learning that Daniel's life that his faith in God is just that, that it is resolute. And it's apparent that whatever comes his way, regardless of how difficult the situations or unexpected or even life-threatening, we could say, these situations have been, Daniel stands strong and resolute in his faith like none other. And again, I'm, I'm hoping that you've been learning and gleaning this from his life. His faithfulness is so outstanding that wherever he goes, he is just a walking example of integrity of faithfulness and godliness to all of Bab Babylon, and it seems like he no doubt is making a difference. He excels to the top in every position um, that he is given and very quickly rises even to the top of his class and to the top of Babylon, a pagan city with pagan kings and leaders. A man devoted to his God makes it to the top. How does that work? Well, that's what we've been learning, and that's what's been amazing us throughout the process. In the last verse of Daniel chapter 1, it reminds us of this detail that Daniel, again, is in this foreign land. It drops kind of a few hints to help us understand kind of the, the, the faithful tenure that he had in Babylon. And Daniel chapter 1, verse 21 says this, And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. And so here in the very beginning of chapter 1, this last verse, it's kind of this little footnote um, and if we fast forward through all of the reigning kings of Babylon, and then we also do a little math at the same time, we can figure out that the length of his stay in Babylon and what it was, which, by the way, was most of his life, right? I think we need to remind ourselves of that, that he was taken exile, you know, into Babylon at a, a young age of a teenager, between the age of 14 or 19. This is his life. And then we last left off with last week in Daniel chapter 6, verse 28, and notice what it says and how it very similar to chapter 1. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 6, these two little verses are not so much a footnote as it is a summary of the long life and the longevity of ministry that Daniel had. And we've learned over these last few Sundays that Daniel is now well into his 80s. Some believe at this time, even in chapter 6 and in going into chapters, well, it's heaven in a different place, but that he's well into almost his 90s. And so, again, this is how old he is, and he's lived throughout the entire, ba entire Babylonian period. The exile, he's continued into the reign of Cyrus when the Jews were eventually released from captivity, thus outliving even his Babylonian cap, um, uh, captors themselves. This is Daniel. So Daniel's influence has been so far-reaching that I don't think we fully understand 
how his resolute faithfulness, his integrity, and his uncompromising character changed the course of history. And today we're going to talk about a little bit of that. One commentary that I've been referencing that's called Exalting Jesus in Babylon says this, Daniel served in his influential position for 70 years. His integrity and uncompromising character had far-reaching results. For when I see the wise men coming from the east, I think of the impact Daniel's theology must have had upon the Chaldeans' astrology. God gave him the influence that I believe led to the decree of Cyrus to, to send the people back to their land. Influence that led to the rebuilding of the wall under Nehemiah and to the reestablishing of the nation of Israel. Influence that eventually led the wise men to come to crown the king who was born in Bethlehem. Daniel was behind the scenes of the history of the Messiah as well as the Messiah's people. Daniel had unlimited influence for through his prophecy, he brings homage to the one who is the king of kings and lord of lords, see Revelation 19, who reigns forever. So today, instead of starting in chapter 7 and then having an off week and maybe getting confused, um, we are going to do something a little bit different. Today is going to be a, sort of a little bit of a recap. Maybe we'll ask some questions along the way and just kind of see how you are doing in all of that. But we're going to do this in a way that we're going to discover how the book of Daniel also has been pointing us to Jesus all along the way, but maybe we've been missing it. As, as I've been kind of wrapping myself around the story, there's been so many Sundays that, that I've wanted to almost like take a break and kind of share with you a, about how the book of Daniel is pointing us to Jesus in so many other ways that it's so profound. And so today we're actually going to do that. We're going to take time to really just do just that. And I want us to discover how Jesus really is a, a true and better Daniel. Jesus is, is the true and better Daniel. And we could honestly go chapter by chapter and look at the numerous connections that Daniel has to Jesus as it's kind of helping us and kind of pointing to someone greater, pointing to someone bigger, even on into the uh, prophetic portions of Scripture as well, and we see that. And so we're going to go back to look to see how Jesus is exalted and how Jesus is pointed um, to in the book of Daniel. When we first began our series, we learned that Daniel has three friends. How many of you remember those three friends' names? Okay, good. What about their Hebrew names? I heard one or two of them. Good job. We'll, we'll come to them in just a second. So, but we always like to say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because it's a little bit easier for us to remember their names. Um, and we, remain, we, we kind of learned that they too, like Daniel, have been resolute in their true identity as followers of the one true God. Remember this term, premeditated, that they had decided ahead of time to never do anything that would be disobedient to their God. And they were a shining testimony and witness both to God's providence and most certainly to His grace. And it's been clear from the very beginning that God had a plan and that God had a purpose all throughout Daniel's life, all throughout his friend's life as well. And Daniel never deviated from that plan. Daniel was faithful. God chose and sent Daniel and his three friends. Here's the Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and... Hananiah, Hananiah, Hananiah. Yeah, good job. Okay. Azariah. Okay. Um, he sent these three uh, friends of Daniel kind of on a missionary journey, making them leave all that was familiar so that they might bear a faithful witness to the pagan kings and nations in the foreign lands where they now find themselves. Now, as we think about the beginning of Daniel's story, as, as he is in the exile again in Babylon, his story represents beautifully another story. I'm just going to ask that today you put your seatbelts on and your thinking caps on. I haven't said that in a long time, but anyway, just put your thinking caps on and uh, kind of follow me here as we kind of go through this little journey together uh, because this story is beautifully represents another story. This Hebrew, Daniel, typifies another Hebrew who will arrive 600 years later, and he will also be sent into a foreign land to bear witness to the one true God, and this Jew's name is Jesus. Like Daniel and his three friends, Jesus, the Son of God, would leave his home and willingly embrace a sinful world without defiling himself even once. 
notice a few passages of Scripture that help us to kind of understand Jesus and how he lived his life. And we know that Jesus was fully God, but yet fully man. He was tempted in every way, but he never gave in to sin, not even once. And here's what Hebrews 4.15 says a little bit about Jesus' character. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet he was without sin, yet he did not sin. First Peter chapter um, uh, 2, verse 21 uh, through 23, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, right, that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Indeed, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Back to those Hebrew boys, Daniel and his three friends, they would live such resolute lives that everyone around them, remember, would find favor in these guys. Others would be amazed at the amount of wisdom. They would be amazed at the amount of literature and things that they were learning and how fast they were learning and the type of understanding that they had. Notice if we go back to Daniel chapter 1 and look at verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Notice chapter 1, verse 20, to every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. He found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Do you see some connections here? And just follow me here as we're going through this. Jesus, too, would also find favor with God and man. Remember, Jesus is earlier years. I wish we had more of, you know, biblical information about his life as younger years, and we have a little bit. And here's um, Luke chapter 2, verse 40. It says, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom. This is in reference to Jesus. And the grace of God was on him. In this same passage, this is when Jesus gets left behind. You remember this? His parents, you know, are kind of like doing parent things, and they're not paying attention, and they leave one at Walmart, and everybody flips out, right? Where is my child? And so, similar kind of thing happens. And so, um, as a boy, Jesus is lost by his parents, and he's later found teaching in the temple. Remember, some of you might remember that story, and so that's where this context is all around. And, and then when they find him, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers, even at a young age. Verse 52, it even says this, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So Jesus is learning and he's growing at such an outstanding kind of divine kind of rate, right? And everybody is just in awe of his wisdom. Daniel and his three friends have been stripped from their homeland and the comforts of family. They were officially at the start of their new mission in their life. And they're now living in a foreign land and being tempted by this pagan emperor to live by the rules of the now pagan world that they find themselves in. To defile themselves and to disavow their God is what the, the, the pagan world is trying to prod them to do. We don't want you to believe in your capital G God anymore. You're in a new world. You're in a new land. It's called Babylon, so get with the program, right? Right? And so you remember all of those. And the first test of Daniel and his three friends in this new foreign land comes to pass right away in Daniel chapter 1. They were encouraged to eat the royal food, had most likely been offered to idols of the false gods of Babylon. And Daniel and his three friends remained resolute to their God. And they said, we have already decided, we've premeditated that when we're faced with this kind of temptation, we will not bow down and worship any other god except our god, and we're not even going to entertain that royal food that's been possibly offered to other gods. We're not even going to go there. And notice Daniel 1 verse 8. By the way, sorry for those of you who, have, if you're just for your first time joining us, we're going like at a rapid like rate through all of this, and hopefully you'll get like a sentence or two that might make sense for you. <laughs> um, hopefully more than that. We trust that the Holy Spirit will work. Verse 8, it says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Keep that in mind now. 
And now let's look at Jesus' life by comparison. Jesus, again, being the greater Daniel, the greater Hananiah, the greater Mishael, the greater Azariah. Like Daniel, Jesus refused to compromise and remained resolute when he too faced, we could say, the emperor of all emperors, we call him Satan, the enemy himself. If we go back to the beginning of Jesus' mission, we just looked at Daniel and his three friends in the beginning of their mission. They've been stripped from everything comfortable, and now they're placed in this foreign land, and the mission begins. Go back to the beginning now of Jesus' mission. This is the beginning, the start of his mission. He's been baptized, and the moment after he is baptized, he now is kind of whisked away where he is kind of begins this fasting kind of time for 40 days and 40 nights. And in this time, mission begins, and we could say the enemy begins. The enemy doesn't let off. Let off. Now, we know the enemy had other times and other parts of the story. We don't want to look at that, but his mission begins, and the enemy is like, oh, no, you don't. And so enter the enemy, and Jesus is now being tempted. He's being tested in the wilderness. We, it's kind of what this story is from. Luke, you can look at Luke 4, Matthew 4, and also Mark 1, or Mark's account, these different accounts here where he's been fasting now for 40 days. Jesus is hungry. We know that's an understatement. Jesus, again, fully man, fully God. The human side of Jesus, we could say, is starving. He is at a weak point in his life. And the tempter, the enemy, Satan himself, comes to Jesus at this possible weak moment in his life, and he is tempted. How does Satan tempt Jesus to defile himself? Some of you may know some of that story. Part of it, he does it with food. So he's He's fasting for 40 days. What else? I mean, what, what, a, what a great plan, right? The enemy has. I'm going to tempt him with food, just like Daniel and his friends. Yet Jesus remains what? Resolute. Rock solid. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah will go on to be faithful witnesses before the chief official, Ashpenaz, and King Nebuchadnezzar. And they would eventually be, be brought to live in the king's palace. God performs a miracle. Jesus, by contrast, would also give a faithful witness before Herod the Great and Pontius Pilate later on in his life, but yet he would be nailed to a cross. And yet by his death, all who place their faith and trust in him, including you and I, will live forever with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in his eternal palace. So we too can also take courage in whatever God calls you to do, just like God called Daniel and his three friends. Remember last week, if you're not dead, God's not. Oh my goodness, this is terrible. So two of you were listening last week. Um, you should like put that on your fridge, all right? So <laughs> if you're not dead, God's not done. And you can be confident in knowing that God will be with you in every situation, just like he was with Daniel. And he will accomplish so much more, I think, than you and I know, but it really begins and it starts with you and I being resolute. It starts with our faithfulness, even in the small things, even in the small things. Um, if we can be faithful in the small things, it's much easier to be faithful in the big things. In Daniel chapter 2, we learned that King Nebuchadnezzar was sleepless in Babylon, and part of the reason for his insomnia uh, was that he was having some dreams that kind of were leaving him a bit uh, paranoid. But these were not just any dreams that were troubling him, but they were kind of happening on a repetitive um, scale here. And remember in these days that a dream wasn't just, you know, something that messed you up from the night before and eating tacos too late, but, but a dream was, could be something significant. Especially if you were a, of, of a king or in somewhere in that kind of line and you had a dream, kings would want to know, what does that dream mean? There's got to be some kind of significance. There's got to be some kind of meaning behind that. And so um, you would also know that it may not just speak of the now, but dreams may speak of the future as it did even in King Nebuchadnezzar's um, situation. So king is, the king nebs all ears, right? So he summons all the wise men, you remember this, uh, the magicians, the astrologers, and on and on with the list, and he says, I need you guys to go ahead and tell me what this dream means. We learn that they can't do it. So the king orders all the wise men, including Daniel, because he's guilty by association, and he says, okay, I'm going to kill you all. Then what good are you? 
If you're not good to me, then you're not good to anybody, and I'm just going to end your life now, um, and so uh, let's just terminate them now. And so he sends out his people to go ahead and begin terminating all the wise men. Word gets to Daniel that you know, there's now a hunt for his head as well, as he is one of the wise men here. Daniel decides that you know, he's going to intervene and do whatever he can to kind of stop this from taking place, and so he does what he does all the time. And what does he do? He... Praise. Yes. Thank you. You got it. All right. We learned that last week. Daniel always goes to prayer. Always, always, always goes to prayer. And this is what he did. So God answers his prayer and gives him the interpretation of the dream. And he goes before King Nebuchadnezzar. And you remember that then he interprets it. His dream, if you remember, is kind of really, really weird, but strange, right? It's a huge statue, and it's made up of various sections, and each section is called, you know, kind of made up of various, you know, metals, and from the top down, we look at the head of gold, which was the Babylonian Empire. So each of these, remember, kind of represents a different empire, um, each less glorious and less powerful than the one before it. And um, and so that's what they mean. And so we look at the head of gold, which was the Babylonian Empire, which represented King Nebuchadnezzar, that represented his great empire. Then there was the chest of arms and silver, the Medes and the Persians, and the belly and thighs were made of bronze, which was the Greek or the Grecian Empire. And then the, the legs of iron, we think of those, those strong Roman Empire. Then Daniel speaks of ten toes made of iron and clay and the final world empire. And we're like, man, that's such a strange dream. And it was, but each each meaning had this significant understanding that was so important. So later in Daniel, by the way, this theme will come up again. Uh, many scholars conclude, and they talk about the ten toes of, and kind of what that all represents. It's going to talk about ten future kings or kingdoms at another time, and we'll get to Daniel 9 at some point in another uh, Sunday. So Daniel in this chapter 2 is a foreshadowing of Jesus now, keep all of that in mind that we just kind of quickly did a fast-forward review of. Daniel is a foreshadowing of Jesus. God took a conquered Hebrew prisoner of war and stood him confidently before the ruler in the reality of his own execution as King Nebuchadnezzar and his team was now on the hunt for Daniel himself. This is a foretaste of of what Jesus would later do for us, except that Jesus not only faced execution, but we could say that Jesus endured execution. Daniel then tells the king that this statue will then be destroyed, right? And he says this statue is going to be destroyed. It's going to be smashed by a rock. And he says this in verse 34, while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. This is a divine rock. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. That's like a terrible ending to a dream, right? It all like seems to be going somewhat well, at least according to Neb, and he just didn't understand all the other things, and then boom, it's smashed. Question, who is the rock that strikes the statue and smashes it to pieces? Okay, Jesus. Good. Some of you, we, we, we got it. So Jesus Christ is the rock. So God sent a rock to the earth called Jesus, who in the end will eventually destroy every false counterfeit kingdom that will ever have been created by man, we could say, whether those are large kingdoms like the Roman Empire or tiny kingdoms like the kingdom of your own heart. But Jesus came first to save. Aren't you glad? Came first to save. He came to die on a cross to save us from the kingdom of ourselves and from the kingdom of the mess of our own little world called sin. He came to be a rock of salvation that we could build our lives upon, but we have a choice to make. We either surrender to him or we surrender to the kingdoms of this world. Psalm 118 verse 22 also speaks of a rock. Notice what Psalm 118 says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. I want you to think about this, this decision, this choice that every person in the world will have. We can trust to follow God. We can trust to, tr to, to follow Jesus and to, um, to place our faith in Him, or we can reject Him. We have a decision. We can reject Him or we can trust Him. Jesus Himself also quotes from Psalm 118 in Luke chapter 20. He's in the midst of kind of talking with some of his disciples and those who are around him, and he's 
he's kind of sharing a parable. That's kind of what's happening in the context around this. And in this, he then says this in chapter 20. He says, Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So Jesus is quoting from an Old Testament verse back in Psalm 118. Everyone who falls on that stone, he says, will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Here, Jesus, you could say, is making a direct connection to Daniel 2. The stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone, is the stone that breaks and crushes everyone on whom it falls. Follow me here. Since ancient times, you think about the ways that buildings were constructed. They've used cornerstones in their construction process. The cornerstone was like the strongest stone, and it was the first stone that everything else would be built upon. And so it was in a... Um, where was the cornerstone placed in a building if it was square? Okay, great. All right. <laughs> Five of you have graduated high school. Okay. <clears throat> so the cornerstone was placed... In the corner, and then every other stone was then aligned to the cornerstone. If you get the cornerstone wrong, you get it all wrong, and your building's coming down. They didn't have like pump trucks and pumping concrete in the wall and everything else. I mean, so they're building this strong structure, or we could say temple, with stones, and they're trying to position and place all of these stones in the correct spot. There are several places in the Bible where Jesus is referred to as the cornerstone, and even where he refers to himself as the cornerstone, hence this verse we're looking at right now. 1 Peter 2 says the cornerstone is reliable. 1 Peter 2 says it's that the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame, that we can trust Jesus as our cornerstone. When we read in Scripture that Jesus is the cornerstone, it means that he's rock solid. It means that he's precious. It means that he's worthy of our praise. It means that we can align every other aspect of our life off of him as we are building our life upon him because he's trustworthy and we can trust him to be that secure foundation. So we just sang a song, I will build my life upon, right? Your love for you are a firm foundation. Unfortunately, not everyone in the decision, they either can reject Jesus or trust Jesus. But not everyone chooses to trust Jesus. And so many will reject Jesus. Psalm 118 and Luke 20 both tell us the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Some say, I, I'm not going to build my life off of the one true cornerstone. I would rather build my life off of my own desires and off of my own little kingdom and off of how I view life should be because I think life is all about me, me, me. And so they don't like other people telling them what to do and they don't like the idea of a God telling them what to do. And so they just say, well, fooey on that. And so we reject God. Now picture Solomon's temple for a second being built or picture some other massive structure being built. We know from history that when the temple was constructed, Scripture tells us that there was to be no construction noises at the temple site, that everything had to be kind of the rock quarry is where all of the chiseling and hammering would take place. Now think about this for a second. You look at 1 Kings chapter 6, when it's telling us about Solomon's temple. In building the temple, only blocks dressed at the quarry were used and no hammer, chisel, or any other iron tool was heard at the temple site while it was being built. This is why when we're building our VBS sets, we do all of our cutting outside. I'm, it's a total terrible joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we did because the smell of like burnt like plastic. You walk in there, it's like, oh, what is going on in here? And then you see Bob or Lynn with like this hot knife and they're melting plastic and it's permeating the whole building, and I'm like, how can we worship in a place like this, right? Then the skill saws are running and sawdust everywhere, but you can imagine that that's why they had certain rules, because the temple was a holy place. It's where you worship. We don't want to hear a hammer, and we don't want to hear a chisel. It, it is a time of beautiful silence before our almighty God. 
And so all of the rocks were dealt with in the rock quarry. And so the hammers and the chisels and everything else were taken place. And, and those massive stones were hewn off site and then hauled to the construction site. A couple years ago, I was in Israel and I got to stand right there and see some of these stones. And if you've been there, it will blow your mind. I don't even know how they would get a stone that size with, with like, like a massive crane today and not kill somebody. The stones are just massive. Hundreds and hundreds of tons is how much some of these stones weigh. Some believe that there are some that are 500 tons. It's unreal. And these stones were hewn and cut off-site and then brought in and then used for the temple. So the builders would look at all the stones that were available as the stones. Some of those stones were coming in, and they almost think giant Legos. And they're beginning to look at these stones and study these stones to kind of figure out what stone would go in what position and what would fit here best and there best and what would make the best cornerstone. And a stone that was unsuitable at one stage could be useful at another stage. But often, or sometimes when that stone would come in, they would say that this, this stone isn't useful. In fact, we're going to reject this stone. And they would just drop that stone or push that stone off to the side, and so that stone was cast away. And some historians and stories tell us that this actually happened, that there were times when the stones would come in and they would just cast that stone away, and this was a part of the process. And that some of the people in, that the people in Israel, when Jesus is, is quoting this to those who were listening, they would know exactly what Jesus is talking about. The stone the builders rejected. It, it, it's the stone that's not useful. It's the stone that people cast aside because it's the stone that, no, 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 that, that stone isn't going to do anything. It's, so we're just going to push that one to the side and we're going to reject it. So what appeared to be useless, though, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone has become useful, has become the most important stone in the entire structure, period. The cornerstone. And so Daniel points to Jesus, the stone the builders and even the world has rejected. He is the perfect stone, the precious stone, the stone God will exalt and use to build his kingdom, one that will never be destroyed. We now move to Daniel chapter 6. I'm only looking at three examples, and this is the last example. And I know I skipped the fiery furnace, and that one is awesome. Um, but because there's, a, there's a, a, another in the fire, and as a song, there's another in the fire. Anyways, um, so we know who that person is. We're not going to talk about that one, okay? I'm sorry. But we're going to talk about Daniel chapter 6. And I, I love Daniel 6 where we left off last week. I felt like this one's kind of fresh in our minds. So we looked at Daniel 6, the last part of the narrative portion of Daniel's life. It contains, as we learned last week, one of the most well-known Bible stories, I think, among those who are Christians and those who are, on, are, are not believers. Um, and we find that Daniel is in quite a serious mess. At first, you know, he kind of just kind of has these kind of roller coaster moments where everything's wrong and he's about to like lose his head. And then the next moment, it's like, everything's great. And then it kind of dips again. And so here it's, he's um, again, serving well into his 80s. He's living the good life in some way, we could say, not in, not in terrible ways. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying there. Um, he has distinguished himself among all other administrators and leaders, including King Darius himself. And King Darius highly respects Daniel, so much so that Daniel continues to climb the ladder of success, and Daniel's not even asking. This is just what's happening in Daniel's life because of his faithfulness. He's getting all the promotions. He's getting all of the raises. And all of the rest of the employees are a bit hot. You ever have that happen in real life? This is exactly what's happening here, okay? Um, and so they aren't happy. And these other leaders are jealous, to say the least. And so they come together to find some way to bring Daniel down. Hopefully you remember this. This was just last week. If you weren't here last week, you can go back and catch it on YouTube. And you can catch the whole story. But they couldn't find any wrongdoing in David's life in order to bring him down. Well, we'll just say he's a liar. Well, that won't work because he's not a liar. Okay, well, what else? You know, and they begin to kind of collaborate and kind of bring these ideas together. But because he lived such a life that was above reproach, they had nothing on him. They had nothing. 
And so his enemies said, we will never find any basis, I'm quoting this, for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So they coax King Darius to issue a new law, and this is what they say as they remind, or they tell King Darius, may King Darius live forever, a little kissing up. The royal administrators, uh, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. And here's our story for those of you who missed it last week. Probably, the, again, one of the most popular stories in all of the Bible. Definitely the top 10. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it into writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. You remember we talked about the history of that? So King Darius put the decree in writing, um, and it's a done deal. So the law is put into writing, and Daniel goes about living his life as resolute as he always did, because he had premeditated and decided ahead of time that I will never do anything that is disobedient to my God. So he returns to his house, his upstairs room, Scripture says, where his windows opened towards Jerusalem, and three times a day, he got down on his knees, and what did he do? He prayed, just as he had done before. Remember that line from last week, just as he had done before. So Daniel gets busted, because Daniel is praying to another god other than King Darius, because he's doing what he always did. The issue was then brought before the king. The king was greatly distressed because he knew he had been duped. And because of his high respect for Daniel, he knew that this meant that Daniel's life was now on the line. But the administrators remind the king, king, remember what you said. Remember no edict, no rule, no law can be repealed, king. You're you're in this, buddy. But the king decided until sundown, remember, trying to do whatever possible to relieve Daniel from this um, uh, terrible uh, thing that was going to take place to him next, being thrown into the lion's den. Daniel 6, verse 16 and 17. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. The next morning, remember what happens. The king wakes up. He couldn't sleep all night. He was sleepless and and whatever, and he was worried about Daniel. Couldn't sleep. He runs to the lion, then shouting, Scripture says, in an anguished voice, is the way the NIV words it. And he says, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answers, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. It's kind of clearing, you know, you know just kind of clearing things up there. As we've been learning each week more and more about Daniel's life, if there's one takeaway that you should take away from Daniel's life. And it's been the one word that we've been throwing out to you every single week that you find it on the worship guide. And what's that word? Resolute. Resolute. Thank you, church. That's good. Good answer. Because if you didn't get that one, it's tough. I can't help you anymore. (laughs) Every week we're helping you with that. And I say that word probably a hundred times in every sermon. But this was Daniel's life. He was resolute in Babylon And in some way, what we're learning is, part of what we're learning is that that we too want to be like Daniel. But, But I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to just walk away from this sermon series thinking that I've got to be more like Daniel. I've got to be more like Daniel. Maybe you've heard back in the day, dare to be like Daniel. Maybe some of you have been in the Christian thing for a while. You remember that? I think that was even a book, dare to be like Daniel. And so I don't want that to be the only thing that you learn and come across is that I need to emulate Daniel. I need to emulate Daniel. I need to be like Daniel. I can do this. Although that's a good point, and I want that to be one of your takeaways. But I don't want you to miss the main point of the story, or we could say the main point of any Old Testament story for that matter, is not just learn to emulate their lives. The Old Testament was not primarily written to give you heroes to emulate 
but rather a savior to adore. That, that all throughout these Old Testament stories, and I could tell you how, how Jesus is a better Abraham, how, and go right on how Jesus is a better Ruth, how, and go right on down the list of all of these unbelievable stories that you and I have read since we were kids, some of us, and some of us may be newer, and we're beginning to understand what those stories mean, but those stories are pointing and exalting Jesus. They're pointing to something more significant. They're helping us to understand that Jesus is a greater Daniel. And if you and I simply try and copy Daniel's life or David's life or Abraham's life or Ruth's life or whoever's life, I, I think there will be times that you might be disappointed because we just can't do it. The disciples themselves couldn't do it. And you'll get frustrated. But when we see that Daniel's story, like all of the stories in the Old Testament, are there ultimately pointing us to Jesus, I believe that this story can, can take on a new meaning for us. That can tell us that, you know what, yeah, we, we can't do it. We can't do it without Jesus. Think of some of the parallels as we kind of continue now to kind of wrap this up a bit. But um, think of some of the parable, uh, parallels between what Daniel went through and what Jesus went through. And I'm going to just kind of list some of these that I came across this week. And I bet you there are more. And these are just some interesting little um, parallels. And here's the first one. Both Daniel and Jesus are pictures of the innocent. Daniel is one of three men in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Think about this. <clears throat> one of three men in the Old Testament about whom there is no mention of one single flaw. This is Daniel's life. Now, was Daniel perfect? Of course not. He was human. He wasn't divine. He was human. But Scripture doesn't mention any flaws about his life. That's pretty fascinating. What could they write about your life or my life if someone was writing your memoir? <laughs> what would they write about you? I could pretty much guarantee you that they're going to, you know, unless it's a really good friend, <laughs> <all right. laughs> that they're going to insert some kind of nastiness along the way because we're all human, right? Daniel's life, his biography here, there, there's, there's no flaws. You want to know what the other two are? I think it's Joseph and Jonathan. In fact, in Daniel 6, verse 4, it tells us that the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charge against Daniel in his, contact, in his conduct right, of governmental affairs, but they were unable to do so. It was just this, another reminder of, of the kind of character. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Again, we, we know he wasn't perfect, but there's no mention of a flaw in his life. Next, both Daniel and Jesus had jealous political leaders who were after them. Both of them had leaders who kind of drummed up false charges against them in, in an effort to get them killed. We see that in Jesus' life. It seems like every corner he was around, there was some religious leader or some political leader who was trying to end his life. Daniel's none other. The roller coaster of his life was up and down. People seemed to target him over and over and over. Next, both Daniel and Jesus had the primary, um, had uh, the primary judge in charge, declare them innocent, and then try to spare their life. For Daniel, that would have been King Darius, we just read that story, who loved Daniel, right, who respected Daniel, and he was greatly distressed over the fact of that situation. He did whatever he could to stay up all night trying to figure out how he was going to, you know, free Daniel of this terrible charge. For Jesus, this judge in charge would be Pilate, he was a bit confused as to what he should do. Remember, Pilate, remember his own wife gets involved and says, look, have nothing to do with him. And so remember, if you know the rest of the story, um, he washes his hands of Jesus and sends them on. Both Daniel and Jesus were thrown into a pit whose entrance was covered by a large stone and sealed with a government seal. I'm just curious, you don't need to raise your hand, but how many of you picked up on that when the stone was rolled over the lion's den? Fascinating. Just interesting little new, new, new little details there. That was in Daniel chapter 6, verse 17. It says, A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. For Daniel, it was a lion's den that was going to be his tomb. For Jesus, it was his tomb. 
both Daniel and Jesus had loving friends, run to their tomb early in the morning. For Daniel, it was King Darius. For Jesus, it was some of his most beloved followers, including women, who were there to first see what had taken place and were amazed that Jesus was alive. Both Daniel and Jesus walked out of the tomb alive. Both Daniel and Jesus, after their ordeal, were raised up in special command over the kingdom. For Daniel, it was under King Darius. For, for Jesus, it was under the God or God the Father in heaven. And one day in the future, Revelation tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he will rule and reign. He does now, but he will most certainly, everyone will recognize that he is leading, even though some are not now. But there is one big difference between Daniel and Jesus. Daniel eventually died. But Jesus defeated death. Psalm 22 is, is kind of a messianic um, psalm that's written about Jesus. And in verse 21, it says, Rescue me from the mouth of the lions, in reference to Jesus. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. lions. Think about the detail. When Jesus was on the cross, he was thrown to the lions of judgment those lions which encircled him and taunted him and then literally tore him, tore him apart. Jesus was far more innocent than Daniel ever was, yet before Jesus' body reached the bottom of the pit, he only made it about six hours, Scripture says. Daniel survived all night. For Jesus, the lions had torn him to pieces. Unlike Daniel, no angel came to stand by him and shut the lion's mouths as Jesus was under attack. No angels. God the Father turned his back on him. Came across a quote this week by the author um, of, a, of a children's Bible, a storybook Bible, um, Sally Jones. It says, Jesus was left in the blackness, utterly alone and abandoned by God suffering the fate that we, the guilty ones, deserved. God did not shut the mouths of Jesus' lions like he did Daniel's. He let them tear him apart. His body was left entombed in the icy grip of death for three days before the angel finally came uh, to roll his stone away. But during that time, Jesus was bearing our sin. He went into that pit, right, for you and me and that's where Jesus and Daniel are different. This author continues on, and she says, When Daniel came forth from the lion's den, he came out alone, and no one else was saved by God's deliverance of him. Follow me here. This is important. But when Jesus came forth from the tomb, he came out as the head of a mighty company of people who had been redeemed from the pit through his death. Because of the work of Christ on behalf of his people, the divine judge says, Not guilty. You may go free. You see, Jesus is a greater Daniel who took our place among the lions and suffered a brutal death on the cross for our sins, sins that should condemn you to hell and sins that would condemn you to hell. But Jesus is a greater Daniel who stepped in to save us, willingly offering his life and going to the lion's receiving the wrath and the judgment of God for all of our wrongdoings so that you and I could have life. And for all of those who call upon the name of Jesus, Scripture says you will be saved. And you're guaranteed to be removed and exempt from the wrath of God because Jesus on the cross has already taken your place. You're guaranteed not just to live one day with him for all eternity, but you are guaranteed to have a new living hope right now in this life that you and I live. Knowing now that Jesus' life is, or that Jesus to whom Daniel's life points, when, when, we, when we understand this, I, I think this can give us new courage. Courage to face danger just like Daniel and to be resolute just like Daniel and his friends. 
that we can have the kind of courage to the ability to get up and keep going when the unexpected seems to come our way. And so I think we can thank God for the examples like Daniel, thank God for the example of his friends, and we can worship Jesus, our living hope, who took the punishment for our sins so that we could have life. I came across a prayer um, this week. I don't even know this person, but he, he's an author for Gospel Coalition. His name is Scotty Smith. And, and this was a prayer that he wrote on the narrative portion of Daniel's life. And I felt like it was kind of a, a neat way that we could close our time out. So as our praise team comes and prepares to close us out, I want you to just, if you could, just, just bow your heads and just listen to this prayer. And may this be our prayer today. Dear Lord Jesus, the older I get, the more I'm intrigued by the life of Daniel and his exiled friends. May the gospel bring me greater freedom to live and love as this man did with passion and conviction, wisdom and hope. I used to read the book of Daniel as a Christian survival manual for believers waiting to be lifted off the face of the earth, but that's not the way you wrote the book. I now realize that Daniel is a testimony to your commitment to redeem your every nation people and to make all things new, even in Babylon. It's your intent to extend the transforming presence of your kingdom wherever you send us in every part of the world and every sphere of life. Jesus, free us to live and love as Daniel did, as conduits of your mercy and grace. Gospel presence, not fearful paranoia, is the order of the day. Keep us wise to the particular defilements that wage war against our hearts and your story, not just the things in Babylon, but also the things in the dark continent of our hearts. I now realize the more fully we give ourselves to knowing and loving you, the less enticed we'll be with the royal food and wine of the wrong kingdom. Indeed, Lord Jesus, you are the greater Daniel the true and eternal King, the one who lived and died for our freedom. Nourish us with the royal food of your kingdom. As bread of heaven, feed us till we want no more. As the giver of the living water, quench our thirst that we might live and love as Daniel did, with passion and conviction, wisdom and hope. Until the day you return to finish making all things new, we pray all of this in your loving and holy name. Amen.